Philip Seymour Hoffman, a 46-year-old accomplished Oscar award-winning actor and director, was found dead on the bathroom floor of his Manhattan, New York apartment on Sunday, February 2, 2014, of an apparent drug overdose with a needle still in his arm, according to law enforcement officers. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators discovered somewhere in the ballpark of 50 envelopes of what they believed to be heroin in his apartment. They also found used syringes, prescription drugs, and empty plastic baggies those typically used to contain drugs. Two days later, on Tuesday the 4th, police arrested four people in connection with the drugs found in Hoffman's apartment and recovered 350 small plastic bags of what is believed to be heroin. The district attorney's office declined to prosecute one suspect. Two others were released pending court appearances. The fourth suspect, Robert Weinberg, is charged with the felony count of criminal possession of a controlled substance. He pled not guilty and is due to appear in court on Valentine's Day. Okay, this guy pled not guilty to a criminal possession, a felony criminal possession of a controlled substance. But my question is, if these people were found because Philip Seymour Hoffman died and they found the drugs in his apartment, of the drugs that these people sold him, then why is not this Robert Weinberg guy charged with, uh, like, manslaughter, or why is the only charge a possession charge? It should be at least distribution charge if they found 350 plastic bags full of heroin. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make any sense that um, that's the only count. Personally, I find it hard to believe that the police, initially having nothing to go on when finding Hoffman dead with drugs all over his apartment, took only 48 hours to not only figure out exactly who supplied the dope to Hoffman, but to also track them down and arrest them. Not just one, but four individuals within 48 hours of investigation. And that's including the time it took for them to report the arrests to the news. So it had to have taken less than 48 hours to make the arrests. Keep in mind, the police still don't know who murdered Tupac Shakur in 1996 and Christopher Biggie Smalls in 1997. It's been almost 18 years since Tupac was killed in Las Vegas and they still have nothing, yet a prominent white actor kills himself with heroin and they're able to finger four people in less than two days. Doesn't that seem questionable to anybody else? To catch perpetrators within 48 hours, you would already have to have a full file on these individuals, knowing full well that they had dealt drugs to celebrities. So why weren't they arrested before Phillip's death? That's an interesting question. Which brings me to the next point in this video. The war on drugs and the Rockefeller monopoly on the pharmaceutical industry. According to Russell Brand, and another prominent actor and comedian, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman was another victim of extremely stupid drug laws. But why are these drug laws stupid and why are they in place today? Most people today are not aware that John D. Rockefeller Jr., who lived from 1874 to 1960, was the man directly responsible for creating and instigating the war on drugs. This so-called war on drugs started in the early 1900s and was carefully planned and orchestrated to protect the family ownership of a chemically-based pharmaceutical drug monopoly. The war was first begun with the help and advice of his father, John D. Rockefeller Sr., who realized the massive profit potential of opium with its strong ability to control men. Jr. was able, by the calculated manipulation of politics, to seize control of all legal narcotics at the time and push criminalization. As we all know, Coca-Cola used to have real cocaine in it, and at one point, people were able to buy heroin over the counter. But there was much more potential for profit with these addictive substances, and the Rockefellers realized this. What if they could make it so you were unable to buy this substance over the counter, but you really needed it for, for your illness, and the only way you could get to that medication that you needed was to actually go purchase it from them themselves, p purchase it from the Rockefellers, you know, that, that's, that's genius. In addition to the, the control of these narcotics, they also, the Rockefellers also set their sights on criminalizing medicinal marijuana for a myriad of reasons we all know. Rockefeller Jr. was largely responsible for the prohibition of marijuana during the 1930s and he was involved with the government-based propaganda movie, Reefer Madness, designed to sway the opinion of Americans. And as we can see today, they did, they did a masterful job. 
To see how the war on drugs has affected the United States, you only have to take a look at how our prison industrial complex has grown since its implementation and, and enforcement. Yet another booming business controlled by the elite. After doing this research, I was left with one burning question. If the United States was so hard on individuals who had used and sold drugs illegally, then why in the world was the CIA heavily involved and working hard to import drugs to America? Then as quick as the question came up, common sense answered the question for me. What better way to make the war on drugs extremely profitable than to make substances such as cocaine, heroin, and marijuana illegal and then import massive quantities of these substances directly into the streets of America. Not only would you be making massive profits off the sales of these drugs all over the country to its addicted customers, but then you could turn around and make arrests, drug and money seizures, and create massive money flow through the court and prison systems. What a masterful plan indeed. You don't need to look far to find that all of this is true. It's a documented, well-known fact that the CIA were, and I use that term lightly, major importers of drugs, creators of crack cocaine, and comically dubbed the Cocaine Import Agency. It is also a documented fact that the United States military was secretly allowing the import of heroin during the Vietnam War. It isn't difficult to do a little research and figure out that the CIA has played a very prominent role in the war on drugs and the profits seen from its inception. It was recently reported that between 2000 and 2012, the U.S. government made deals with the drug cartel in Sinaloa, Mexico, allowing the group to smuggle billions of dollars of drugs in return for information on its rival cartels. Here's an excerpt from the Wikipedia page. The involvement of the United States Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, in cocaine trafficking in Central America during the Reagan administration as part of the Contra War in Nicaragua has been the subject of several official and journalistic investigations since the mid-1980s. It's a classic problem-reaction-solution initiative. The powers of interest create a problem to which they already have a solution, prepared to put in place once we the people react and demand a solution. 9-11 is a perfect example of this, with its profitable outcome being the so-called war on terrorism. Heroin is a major issue in the world today. Its main ingredient is a naturally occurring substance called opium. Over 90% of the world's supply and production of opium comes from the Golden Crescent in Afghanistan. In 1991, Afghanistan became the world's primary opium producer with a yield of 1,782 metric tons of raw opium. As you can see in this graph, Afghanistan's opium production decreased dramatically in the early months of 2001 because of the Taliban banning farmers from growing it, and they'd go around and chop down the fields. Isn't it curious that by 2003, the United States military would be in Afghanistan fighting off the Taliban, hence allowing farmers to resume growing opium, the world's most valuable crop? It's obvious that the United States, or the elites who control it, needed to stomp out the Taliban and guard the opium fields if they wanted to continue making massive profits from it, which is exactly what has happened. Today, Afghan opium production continues to shatter records every year. According to the most recent reports by the United Nations, opium production is nearing the 10,000 metric tons per year mark. And when a gram of heroin typically sells on the streets for about $100 today, the profits from this drug are unimaginable. There are 1,000 grams in a kilogram and 907 kilograms in a ton. So with um, 10,000 tons per year, you do the math. Now we must ask the question, if law enforcement and legislation is so devoted to the war on drugs, then why in the world do we have soldiers in Afghanistan directed by their superiors to safeguard these opium fields? The answer should be common sense to you by now. So what does all this have to do with our dear friend Philip Seymour Hoffman and so many others like him who have succumbed to the whims of heroin addiction? Everything. I must agree with Russell Brand when he says that Mr. Hoffman was another victim of extremely stupid drug laws. Had drugs been legally available over the counter, maybe individuals like Philip would have had a better chance at treatment and survival. But the fact that these actions must be more sneaky and hidden makes it that much more addictive. The mere game of chasing down those drugs and being sneaky is addictive in and of itself. 
Clearly, if there was really an effective war on drugs, heroin or any other illegal substance wouldn't even be a problem today. It seems obvious that there's another agenda going on that we're not told about. Clearly, the war on drugs is a front for a malicious monopoly controlled by the Rockefellers. Their victims are individuals like Philip, who we've enjoyed on screen for many years now in films like Mission Impossible 3, Magnolia, The Master, and the recent Hunger Games. You'll see videos proclaiming how Philip was another sacrificial victim of the Illuminati, and when you understand that the Illuminati is made up of the richest 13 families in the world, understandably, they must make sacrifices in order to keep their wealth and power. And there is no doubt in my mind that the Rockefellers are of those 13 families. Well, and, and speaking about the Illuminati, I just wanted to show this, this one clip here from, um, actually, this is his, I think this is his last interview. So I'll go ahead and play that now where you just keep just uh, pay attention to what he says. Lovely to see you and um, just wanted to know what was your biggest challenge with bringing this character to the uh, big screen? Biggest challenge? Uh, it's, it's the same challenge you always have. I mean, it, uh, uh, to do right by uh, the story and to try to illuminate it in a way that hopefully is uh, surprising, you know, to illuminate it in a way that hopefully is uh, surprising, you know. Here's a quote from David Rockefeller written in his uh, memoirs, his, uh, a book he wrote. For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Castro to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. I'm